I'm continuing to work through my chapter summaries for John Batista. Is it the fifth edition? I can't remember. John Batista College Physics. I'm on chapter 21. I'll be honest with you. Not my favorite chapter. I mean, AC circuits are kind of cool, but the math is really not at the algebra base level. But we're going to plow through anyway because that's what we do. So the first thing is alternating current, alternating voltage, right? And so how do we represent an alternating voltage? So symbolically, we represent it with this little power support. See, I got a little sine wave right there. And then I can say they use the EMF, but I like to say V as a function of T from that is going to be some maximum amount V0 times the sine of omega t. <clears throat> this is a way to make this voltage oscillate up and down. So time is time, and omega is just some angular frequency where omega is 2 pi times the frequency. So if we have uh, a frequency of 60 hertz in the U.S. for our AC power supply, multiply it by 2 pi, and that goes in right there, and this is the time in seconds. So this will give you something that looks like this. Uh, v is a function of time. I'm going to draw a terrible sine wave. They're really not. Okay, something like that. And so as time goes on, it goes up and down. Great. Isn't that great? Um, oh, we can also say that uh, the frequency is 1 over the period. So don't get these three things confused. This is in radians per second. This is in 1 over seconds or hertz. And this, oh, and T is in the time for one complete oscillation uh, in seconds. Okay, let's look at... Um, a simple circuit with an AC source, and it looks like this. The simplest you can get. Now with a refrigerator. Okay, so I have a resistor right there. And there's going to be a current coming out of here that's not constant, obviously, because the voltage is not constant. But we can still use the loop rule. So the loop rule says that the voltage source, which is this, I'll just put V as a function of T, minus uh, the voltage across this, which is IR, is equal to zero. I have to have the voltages add up to zero. That's the loop rule. Loop rule still works. And you see here that the only way for this to work is if uh, I can put V0 sine omega T minus IR equals zero. So I is V0 over R sine omega t. I just solved this for i. But i has to change with time too. That's the only way for this to work. So we're going to get an oscillating current too. And it's going to have the same frequency um, and it's going to have this v over r. And, and if, you, if omega is zero, then we have a, a, a flat line right here that's not changing. Oh no, if omega is zero, you get zero. Well anyway, if you get rid of this term and make this one, then you get v over r, which is what we would expect anyway. And we can write this as i equals I0 sine omega t. So I0 is the maximum current. V0 is the maximum uh, voltage, like that. Is that okay? Now, what about the power? So remember that we define power as I times V. The power in the resistor is the current through it and the voltage across it, which I know the voltage across it is this, right, because it's connected to it. So let's just write that out. I, these both change with time. So I can write I is, let's write it as this if you want to, V0 over R sine omega T. And then V is this, V0 sine omega T. So if I simplify that a little bit, I get V0 squared over R over R. That's a terrible R, look at me. Sine squared omega t. Now, that's the power. And if I plotted that up here, so I'm going to have a dual plot here, which is a bad idea. But it's going to look like this. And this is a bad drawing. So the power is always going to be positive because I'm squaring this sine term. So I'm not going to get any negatives. Over here, I have two negatives, negative times negative, so I get a positive. And it still does go to zero, and it reaches some maximum up here, too. Now, if I wanted to average the, the, veloc the, the velocity, the voltage right here, you can't do it. Well, you can, right? If I have a sine wave that goes up and down, it's going to spend just as much time with positive voltage as negative, so the average voltage is zero. But I can average this power, 
right? Because this is always positive. And it turns out that uh, V0 over R doesn't change, but the sine squared omega T does change. And the average of this is one half. So I can get the average power, P average, is V0 squared over R times one half. And that one half comes from that sine term. Now, if you want to, I could go back and write this as one half uh, I zero V zero, right? Because I is I zero sine omega T, V is V zero sine omega T. So I can just put this back as that and the average of sine squared is one half. And then if you want, you could kind of break that one half into two parts, right? It's two one halves. So I can put one of the one halves, half of the, half of the, multiplication of a half right there, another half right there. So I could write this as I zero over the square root of two, V zero over the square root of two. And we're gonna call these I R M S is I zero over the square root of two, V R M S is V zero over the square root of two. And R M S stands for root mean squared. So this is the same thing as you could get this all by itself. If I take this and square both sides, I get v squared as a function of t is v zero squared sine squared omega t. And then I can average this, right? I can average this because I get a one half. And then I can take the square root. And if I do that, I get sort of like what we call the average current. It's not the average current, which is zero. It's kind of like the average current, right? It's kind of a way to represent this function right there. And that's the RMS, and you can do it for you can do it for current and voltage. Was that fun? Okay, let's go on to a more complicated circuit, and I'm going to uh, use a simulator for this. So here I have suppose I have uh, a voltage source, alternating voltage source, and a capacitor. Well, in this case, I still have to have uh, the loop rule works. So I have V zero sine omega t. That's the voltage right here, and then I have the voltage across the capacitor, which is gonna be minus q over c, that's that. And that's gonna be equal to zero. So you could solve this for q, and I get q equals v zero c sine omega t. And you can see that the charge on the capacitor is not constant because the current goes this way, and then it goes that way, and then it goes this way, blah, blah, blah. And so it's not gonna keep building up. If I want to, I could find the uh, the current, and it's going to be change in Q with respect to time. And this is not so easy now, though, right? V0 is constant. That's constant. But how does this change with time? That's not so clear. Um, it turns out that I can write this as, I'm going, to I'm going to write it out, and I'm going to show you why. I0 sine omega t plus pi over 2. So there's going to be a they're going to be out of phase. The current and the voltage are going to be out of phase. I'm going to do the inductor and then we'll do the simulator at the same time. Now, if I want to, I could kind of get a relationship between the maximum voltage and the current and I get this V0 equals I0 xc. So you think that's like R, right? Cuz there is a relationship between these two. But we don't have the resistance of the capacitor. We have what's called the reactance. Let's put it over here. XC is the reactance. So it sort of acts like uh, a resistor, but not really. And the change in current depends on the value of the capacitance and the frequency, the angular frequency right here. So for a capacitor, this is 1 over omega times c. So a higher frequency, you get a large, a higher frequency gets a smaller reactance, right? Higher frequency, these capacitors act like they're not even there because they don't have time to build up charge on them. Now let's look at the other case. What if I put an inductor in my circuit? So now I have V0 sine omega t minus uh, IL delta i delta t equals zero. Remember, because the voltage across the inductor changes with how the current changes. And 
In this case, I get i as a function of t is i0 sine omega t minus pi over 2. So it's also out of phase, but like completely 100% out of phase with the current from the capacitor. And the reactants for this case, xl is omega times l. So higher frequencies, this acts like more of a resistor. Let me show you how these two things are out of phase with the simulator because it really does help, I think, to see it. So let's switch over here to the computer and I'm gonna build this circuit. Okay, so this is the FET simulator. I'll put a link down below. It's pretty awesome. And you know, maybe a year or two ago, they came out with this uh, AC circuit uh, simulation. So it's really great. So I can add a source. I can drag it right here. I'll put it right here. I'm gonna make a capacitor. And this is a super simple circuit. And then I'm gonna connect a wire here, a wire there. I don't even care what the value is. You can check this for yourself. And you can see that the charge is building up on this capacitor and going away. And I want to measure the voltage and the current as a function of time. So here's my voltage. And I'm going to put one in right there. I can put it across the capacitor. It doesn't really matter. And I'm going to measure the current. This is a weird current measurement, but it works. And I'm going to put this right there. Okay, now let's make this a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger. That's too big. Okay, I'm going to pause it. You'll notice right here that at this point I have peak voltage. But if I look down here, I'm at zero current. That's the peak voltage from here. I have zero current. And as the voltage drops, this current is rising. Okay, that's important. Now let's build an, uh, another circuit. I'm going to put an inductor. It's kind of small for me to see. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. I'm like, I can't see it, but I can't. Okay. I usually would have this uh, maybe a little bit bigger, but just trying to fit everything on here. Uh, I'm going to put this inductor right there. And it's not running, so I paused it. Uh, so let's go ahead and put our the same thing. This right there. This right there. This right there. I'm going to line these up and this right there. Okay, now I'm going to run it. And let's let it go a, a, just a second. What's that little mark right there? Oh, because I stopped it. You'll notice that I don't have the, the, the currents much smaller. Well, maybe not. Okay, let's pause it. So right here I have, ma on the inductor, I have a maximum voltage. And again, if you look down here, it should be maximum voltage. That doesn't seem right. Why is it not, the current's always positive. That can't be right, Maybe, and did I miss it? How come the current's not going? Okay, well, let's not worry about that right now. The important thing is that uh, when this is zero, let's say this is maximum, this is increasing. So that's the opposite of the way the inductor works, that those two are out of phase in different ways. And that's what I wanted to show you. Now, if you wanted to, you could uh, look at the peak, the peak voltage, the peak current, and use that to calculate the, re the reactance. That'd be kind of fun. And compare that to the value of the capacitor right there, which is 0.1 farads. And this has a frequency of 0.5 hertz. So you could calculate the angular frequency and show that that equation works. That'd be kind of fun. Okay, but let's go back to the inductor <clears throat> and the capacitor. And I want to show you what happens when you put them all together in the same time. Again, this is complicated stuff, right? So if I have uh, a voltage source, and then I have a resistor, and then I have a capacitor, and then I have an inductor, they all behave differently with this oscillating voltage source. Remember, this uh, has a current that's in phase with that. That's out of phase by pi over two. That's out of phase the other way by pi over two. And so one way to kind of represent this is with a phaser diagram. And you know, I remember being uh, in physics and thinking this was just crazy, right? So I can represent V as a function of T for here. You could say this is like uh, an, a vector that's swinging around in a circle. 
at a constant uh, angular velocity omega t, that angle is omega t. And then this projection over here would be sine omega t. So you could do that, right? And you can imagine it spinning around. Now, let me draw that again. If I wanted to, I could say at any given time, this is my voltage across the resistor, it, the, which is the same in phase with this source. The inductor is out of phase like this at right angles. Pi over 2 is a right angle. So this is the voltage of the inductor, and this is the voltage phasor for the capacitor. And then the total voltage, you could find the current by using the projection of all these together. So you have to add these as vectors. So I can say uh, V max for the resistor is going to be the square root of V R, the voltage across the resistor squared, plus these two are in opposite directions, but they're perpendicular to that. That's what I'm using the Pythagorean theorem, V L C minus V C quantity squared. I know that's a lot and doesn't always make sense, but that's what it is. And I, I, I don't think I wouldn't really do this in my class because it's just a little bit too much. Um, I think understand how the reactance and uh, induct uh, reactants for a capacitor and inductor is important, but but this I wouldn't do. But then we can write uh, the voltage equals I Z, where Z is the impedance. So that's like the equivalent resistance. But remember, this is a uh, this changed with time, that changed with time. But these are the maximums. So I think this is this. Yeah. And we can find, if I know the reactance for a resistor is just R, and the reactance for the inductor and capacitor, I can say Z is going to be the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC quantity squared. And remember, XL is omega times L. XC is 1 over omega C. There is something important here. Because since we're subtracting these two, it's possible that I could pick a frequency omega such that these two cancel. And that happens when omega is equal to 1 over the square root of LC. And we call that resonance. It's kind of an important thing. Uh, this is basically how a radio, a basic analog radio works, is you adjust the capacitance, you don't adjust the frequency. You can adjust the capacitance right here to get some frequency to pick up the radio station. And that's what works. That's how it works. Because this becomes, these two kind of cancel. And that's that. Okay, like I said, there's a lot of stuff there. And if some of that stuff was, I didn't fully explain because it's algebra's course. Um, just try to get to the bare basics. Definitely play with that FET simulator. It's super awesome.